Titus chapter 2. <clears throat> You're using one of the few Bibles you'll find it on 691 or 1059. And today we're going to close out and finish out chapter 2 by looking at the exhortation of a pastor. The exhortation of a pastor. And next week we'll look at an attempt to cover all of chapter 3 uh, very quickly and look at the admonition of a pastor. The admonition of Verse 1 of chapter 2 said, But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. Verse 6 said, Likewise, exhort the young men. Verse 9, Exhort bond servants. In verse 15, Speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. This repetition Paul uses over and over again in this chapter, especially contrast with the teachings and exhortations of the previous part that we looked at, the false teachers, the crooks, and the teachings of the culture. Though the culture and the false teachers encourage the people of Crete to live one way, Paul tells Titus in chapter 2, no, 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 you don't live how they want you to live, you live this way. And the same is true today. As the false teachers and the culture tells us, this is how you live. This is what you're supposed to do. This is what you're allowed to do. God says, no, 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 no. You don't listen to that. You live this way. The word exhort here in this chapter uh, is the Greek word parakaleo. It means to beg, to plead, and beseech. To invite and encourage. And thus, there are going to be many times within the ministry of the pastor where he will beg and plead, not necessarily in a bad sense, but beg and plead with people in the congregation. Plead with them, behave like a Christian, live like a Christian, pointing out sin. Sometimes those beggings and pleadings will fall on deaf ears. Other times, the exhortation of a pastor will resound in the mind of the believer, and they will adjust their life accordingly. Sometimes, the exhortation of a pastor will be an encouragement to the people. That the, that the believer is living according to what the Bible says. And still at other times, the pastor is going to invite the Christian to do something specific in relation to what the Bible says. So, let's look at... Verses 9 down through 15, or actually we'll start in verse 1 and read verse 1 down through verse 15. That way we have the, the whole picture here in front of us. Titus 2, verse 1. But as for you, in contrast to what they said in verse 1, as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, and patience. The older women, likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded, in all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. Exhort bond servants to be obedient to their own masters, to be well-pleasing in all things, not answering back, not pilfering, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Speak these things, exhort, and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. 
three areas we're going to look at here this morning in this passage is this. The exhortation of a pastor is related to the Christian's societal life or work life, external life outside. And in that, we'll see that the pastor is to exhort the congregation to work like they have been changed by Christ. Number two, we'll see the exhortation of a pastor is related to the Christian's separated life. The pastor is to exhort the congregation to live like they've been changed by Christ. The exhortation of a pastor is related to the Christian's subsequent life. And the pastor is to exhort the congregation to hope like they've been changed by Christ. So first, we'll look at the exhortation of a pastor as related to the Christian's societal life. That was the best, best word that was an S at the front that I could come up with that worked with work. So that's what you got. Verse 9, exhort bond servants to be obedient to their own masters, to be well-pleasing in all things, not answering back, not pilfering, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. The criteria here is specifically directed toward the Christian, the Christian slave, the Christian bond servant. But that's not to say that, that all bond servants and slaves could not have applied it and, and seen the benefits of it working in their lives. But it was especially necessary that these things be true of that slave or that servant that identified as a Christ follower. These were necessary things for them. Now, I understand that the slavery of, of that day was very multifaceted. And, and when we heard the word slavery, we often think of chattel slavery, which is where the slave is owned by the master. Master can do whatever he wants to the slave, and the, that slave has no rights whatsoever at all. And that was true in that day. There were those kind of slaves. The other type of slavery would be what we might call indentured servitude. In other words, someone voluntarily placed himself underneath a master for the benefits that it would bring them. And we looked at that back when we looked at chapter 1, and, and some of the reasoning for why someone would do something like that. Now, the, the very clear modern-day parallel that we would draw is slave and master and employee boss or manager of some sort. And, and, and that is certainly going to be the brunt of the application of this section. But it's not entirely limited to that. The view or the, the scope here is much broader than simply employee boss. It is in every relationship, every area of life where you are subject or underneath someone else for some reason or another. The specific commands that Paul gives to Titus and that God gives to the pastor to give to the servants and to the, the, the employees is this. Be obedient to your master. Do the job that's been assigned to you. Do what your boss has asked you to do. Now, the obvious caveat that I probably don't even need to say is that if you are asked to sin, obviously you're not going to do something that's going to cause you to sin. But, though fairly rare, I would say, that's certainly becoming more prevalent here within our society today, but we're going to obey. We're going to be obedient to those that God has placed over us. And I wrote it down, and it's just, it's, I wrote it down initially and didn't even really think on it too much, but as I thought on it more and more and more, it's, it's become like a light bulb for me, if you will. Obedience is not just for children. Obedience is for everyone, at all times. We are to obey those over us. At all times. And then he goes on to say this. Obedient to their own masters. To be well pleasing. In all things. In other words. We're to do what's asked of us by the master. In order to please. The master. And so that the master is happy. With the work that we've done. Now. 
we can't be, it, it's real difficult to be grumbling and complaining while trying to do something to please someone else. It, it makes that work much, much, much harder. I, I've tried, it's very difficult to do those two things at the same time as trying to please someone else. And our attitude at the same time, so while trying to please the master, our attitude should be pleasing to the master, but most of all, to the master. And, and that's where I want to insert this reality is, though we're doing things, and though, though Paul directs this to those servants of the people on the island of Crete, they weren't simply serving their masters. Those that are Christians, those that were believers on the island of Crete, they were not simply serving the person that was over them. No, they were serving a much greater master, a much higher master. According to Colossians 3, it tells us that we serve God. We do these things because we fear God. We are doing them in service to God. In serving God, we serve those that God has placed above us. The next illustration, or, or not the illustration, the next instruction is there in verse 10. Not Pilfering. Now, we don't use that word anymore. I find it interesting. So, the King James says, not purloining. New King James updated it to pilfering, and neither are the words that we use anymore. But it means to embezzle or misappropriate. In other words, the, the servant is not to steal in any way. The servant is not to... Uh, blatantly steal from the master. He's not to embezzle in that he's not a he's not to use trickery to get around and try and steal from the master. And also included in that is he's not to take the master's resources and use them unwisely. Misappropriating what the master has given him to do, in other words causing the master to lose something or someone. Rather, he says but showing all good fidelity. In other words, showing that they are trustworthy. The way they work, the way the Christian works, the way the Christian does business, the way the Christian interacts with anyone and everyone around them is not in a, in a tricky or conniving way, but rather it's in a way that is he can be trusted in all things. We have a great example of this in the Bible. His name is Joseph, the Hebrew serving an Egyptian, Potiphar. Such, he served him in such a manner that, that Potiphar put Joseph in charge of everything in his house. Yeah. And then, shortly later, after being falsely imprisoned, Joseph does what? He gets put in charge of everything in the prison by the master of the prison because he served in a great way. And then years later, what does Joseph do? He gets, a Hebrew gets put in charge of all the Egyptians to do basically whatever he wanted to do over all these Egyptians. Well, how did all this happen? How did he get promoted in those places? It wasn't because he was serving himself. It wasn't because he was just employing some good, some good notes from what Paul wrote, obviously. But he did it because he was serving God. He served God first. And by serving God first, that enabled him to serve any master in any circumstances, whether he was attacked personally or not, he could serve in all these different areas, obediently, in a pleasing manner, not stealing from them, not misappropriating what they gave him to do, but serving in a trustworthy manner. Now, I noted it in, in the end of last week's message. But the end of verse 10 tells us why we do these things, or, or one of the reasons why we do all these things. That they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Why does the Christian behave in such a manner? Why is the Christian the, the, the best uh, employee, the best servant to those around? Why is the employee like that? Why is the Christian employee like that? Because in doing so, we are glorifying. 
We are magnifying. We are making the name of Christ beautiful in the eyes of those that don't necessarily believe. By behaving in this way, the world may look at the Christian who is dealing with a bad master. Or, let me change that first. The world could look at a Christian serving a good master. And they could look at that person and they could say, well, obviously they're serving obediently and nicely and they're not stealing from him because he has a good master, right? Yeah. But what's really going to shock the world is when a Christian goes out and serves someone that's not a good master. They serve a bad boss and they continue to serve them obediently without stealing. That's going to cause the world to take a second glance and say, there's something different about that guy. How can, how can they do that even when they're serving a bad person necessarily? Yeah. That's going to adorn the doctrine of Christ our Savior. That's going to make the name of Christ big and magnified. Thus, the example of servants, the example of the employee, the example of those subject to others, the example of being honest, Pleasing and obedient becomes an evangelistic outreach to the world. See, Christ didn't call them. He didn't tell Titus, or I guess he didn't tell Paul to tell Titus, tell them that they need to get a shield and a sword and go to war. No, that's not what he told them to do. Rather, Christ came and started changing the lives of individuals. And as he changed the lives of individuals, the power of the redemption of Christ that worked in them changed who they were. And a person forgiven of their sins, redeemed by the blood of Christ, gives that person an entirely different perspective. Gives them an entirely different outlook on how we serve those above us. So first, the pastor is to exhort the congregation to work like they've been changed by Christ. Number two, we see the exhortation of the pastor as related to the Christian's separated life. The Christian's separated life. Look at verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that, denying ungodly and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, they forfeited the perfect relationship that they had had with God at that time. And now because sin was introduced, that relationship between God and human was, was there was a barrier put up in between. There was, there was something that could not quite get them together again. Man now needed a savior. Man needed someone to save him from the just end of his sins which was an eternal death separated from God for all eternity. However, before the world began, as Paul stated back in chapter 1, God could see down through the halls of time, and he would see that man is going to fall short of his glory, and he had compassion on man. That's why Paul told us that even before he began to create he had made a way for man to get back into a right relationship with God. Before he even began to create, one day he was going to send a man to save him. He was going to offer humans grace. Grace, which has been defined as unmerited or undeserved favor. That grace God would give man, the thing that was undeserved was a person. A person just like us, just like all humans. While being physically just like us. Dealing with all the physical things that we deal with. All the temptations that we face. That person would remain perfect. Without sin. And that person would be their savior. And his name was, his name is, and his name always will be Jesus. Jesus has appeared to all men. Now, not physically appearing as we might think, 
Rather, that word appearing there, it carries the, con the, the connotation of illumination, understanding, revelation to the people. In other words, Jesus has been revealed to the entire world. The salvation that is offered through Jesus is available to everyone, without an exception and without any prejudices. All people can taste of the salvation that God has given. However, not everyone will accept that free gift. But for those of us that have, for those of us that have found this grace of God that brings salvation to all men, this grace, for those of us that have found this grace, we found it to be what? True. We found it to be right. We have found it to be undeserving, no doubt, for sure. That grace teaches us a few things. It teaches us that we should deny that which is ungodly. We should deny that which is worldly, the lusts of the world. And in, pl in that place, we should live a separated life. Now, many have taken the words of Scripture and, and, and turned them and said, oh, we have to be separate. Come out from among them and be ye separate. And, and they take that to say, oh, we're going to live over here in our little town with our little thing, and we're going to keep everybody out that's not like us, and we're, and we're going to be really strange, and they use the word peculiar, which we'll come to, and they use that to, to, to justify being a strange and weird aberration, if you will, in society. But that's not at all what it means. When, when I say we are to live a separated life, it's not separated as in away from, but separated as in different than. So, it's this. We don't live ungodly. We don't, we don't live after the, the lusts of the world, as he says. Rather, he says, we live soberly. And that's, of course, a key word that we have seen over and over and over again in this passage. If you remember back just from verses 1 down through verse 8, over and over again, basically for each, all four groups, live soberly, be sober, live soberly, teach them to be sober. And by that soberness, what he was meaning is this. That word sober meant self-control, under control. It gives us and gave us a peek into the Cretan culture of that day. In other words, and, and it even gives us a peek into our world today, uh, the common denominator that stretch all the way from back in the Old Testament, in old times way back then, all the way down through to Paul's day, and even all the way down to our day, what is the predominant view, the common denominator that has been present within all cultures down through the age that are not Christian? Lack of self-control. Doing whatever I want. Whatever makes me happy, whatever I want to do, that's the predominant problem. Those absent of God's grace are identified, not, not, not to broad brush completely, obviously we can see many that are not Christians, that do live self-controlled lives. So, so I'm not going to throw everybody under the bus, if you will, but predominantly. We see them given over to the desires and lusts of their flesh. But that's not the Christian. The Christian lives a self-controlled life. Powered by the word of God, of course. We live soberly and righteously. We live godly in the present age. In other words, we deny the flesh. We reject the sin that will easily beset us. We stop behaving in ungodly and worldly ways. And we live righteously like our Savior lived righteously. We live godly today and every day because we desire to be holy just like he is holy. So, in regard to the Christian's separated life, in regard to our different life, the pastor is to exhort the congregation to live like they've been changed by Christ. We do this because we've been changed by Christ. 
We want to, again, pointing back at verse 10, adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. That's, we work in such a manner that we adorn him, we live in such a manner that we adorn him and make him magnified. And our future is even included in that. Because we see the Christian subsequent life. Verse 13. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Verse 11 pointed us to the first coming of Jesus. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. That, that points us back to Christmas time that we celebrate now. The first time Jesus came. In other words, in order for Jesus to appear to all men, he had to come to earth as that human being. He had to live that perfect life as he did. He had to be lifted up on a tree so he could draw all men to himself. So verse 1 points us, verse 11 points us back to that. But verse 13 points us forward to the future coming of Jesus. Now, Previously, I had mentioned back, I believe it was, uh, might have been the first message of this, that if our hope is only in this life, what good is it? If we only have a hope for this life, what good is it? What good is it that we're eventually going to die if we have no hope of a future, no hope of an eternity with God? The sin of Adam and Eve made it such that, that, that what would have been an eternal life on earth, here, with God, dwelling with God, God walking with us, their breaking of that, destroying that fellowship and communion with God, they made it such that it was no longer possible because sin came. Sin in the introduction of death. So, our salvation needed to include Either when we became saved, we immediately got an eternal life. In other words, we would never die. Or, our salvation needed to include this, eternal life after we die. And that's what God chose to provide. So now we know, according to the other teachings of Scripture, when we die, we do have a hope. To be absent from this life is to be present with the Lord. We also have a hope because one day Jesus will return. Jesus, our Savior, and our hope, and will return. And as Paul says, it is going to be a glorious appearing. Now, I don't believe this is necessarily speaking of the rapture of the church, and we can always debate about that and everything like that, but I would point this to be the second coming of Jesus that is revealed. And it is going to be glorious and magnificent, and it's going to be unlike anything we have ever seen before. Revelation pictures this for us. Revelation 19, verse 11. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. <coughs> the armies of heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth go with a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. He has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings, Lord of lords. We are commanded to look for this hope, this blessed hope, this hope that will be a blessing to all. This glorious anticipation is to be ours. Now, continuing into verse 11, it tells us this. 
who gave himself for us. So we're looking for the same exact person that already was here. We're looking for him to come again and save us a second time, if you will. Through believing in the gift of himself, we are redeemed. However, the ending of verse 14, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. That is, in some respects, a past term event, past tense event. In other words, when we became saved, we were immediately redeemed, changed completely, from then until forever, correct? Yes, we were. But it is also future tense. Remember, we're looking forward to the future. Jesus, giving himself for us, as only but a precursor to what he's going to do for us in the future when we're finally together with him. He is going to redeem us from everything. He is going to give us what we call a glorified body. In other words, there's coming a day when our desire to do things that are ungodly, our desire to do things that are, that are of the worldly lust, our desire for those things, gone. Our desire to do that which is lawless, God. Our desire to do things that would make us unpure, God. He will purify us. He will cleanse us and remove all that from us. He will give us a body that is not corrupted by the evils of sin and death perfect body that we will have for all eternity and we will spend that eternity glorifying and lifting up his name and worshiping him. Amen. He says he'll purify for himself his own special people. And that's the word translated in the King James as the word peculiar. It's the Greek word periousios. And it means this. Acquired possession. In other words, the word carries the thought of this. The person that is going to redeem them, the person that is going to purify them, this special people, they are his acquired possession. He went to war for them to acquire them. Uh, William Barclay said it this way. It was specially used, this word, it was specially used for that part of the spoils of a battle or a campaign which the king who had conquered set apart especially for himself. He went and won the war. He defeated the enemy. And as the king, he said, I want that. I want that. I get this. I get this. And they set aside those things. Those are the kings. Nobody dare touch the king's things. That's what he's talking about when he says his special people. Those that the king has acquired for himself. And what, is, what did Jesus say? Those that the Father has given me, no man will pluck them out of his hand. No man will take them away from him. Those are his spoils of war. That is the victory that he fought against the devil and the legions of the devil and won. And that bride will be his forevermore. The way Charles Spurgeon worded it is this. Saints are Christ's crown jewels. His box of diamonds. His very, very, very own. He carries his people as lambs in his bosom. He engraves their names on his heart. They are the inheritance to which he is the heir, and he values them more than all the universe besides. He would lose everything else sooner than lose one of them. His own special people. And finally, in verse 14, we are redeemed, yes, we are purified, and we are possessed, his own special people. And he says we are zealous for good works. Now, the word zealot, I don't, I don't know how familiar it was there on the island of Crete. Paul most certainly knew what a zealot was. And those in any close relationship with Israel would have known that the zealots were those that fought for the independence of Israel. And they, they, they ran around and they were a clandestine group of people that, that literally gave their entire lives to this cause to destroy and root out the Romans. In the same manner, while some good qualities existed in that, no doubt, there were certainly some 
problematic parts to the zealots as well. But in the same vein, the good quality of the zealots was this. They gave everything to that cause. And one day, we will all be zealots for good works. We will all be zealots. We will all be given to everything for what? For that which is good, that which is right, that which is holy, that which is just, that which is perfect. We will seek and desire with all of our being to do that which is glorifying and honoring to God. And so what those days are going to look like exactly, I don't know yet. But I've asked God that whenever the new earth and everything happens, I want to be a dairy farmer. That's what I want to do. And if I can be a dairy farmer and do all that good work, I don't know if that's going to happen. I don't know what it's all going to look like exactly. But that's what I want to do. But all the good things, all the good works, all that will be glorifying and honoring to God. So to conclude this third point is this. The pastor is to exhort the congregation to hope like you've been changed by Christ. Because we have a hope within us that the world doesn't know. The world doesn't understand. And there's people running around all over this world that, that are looking for some semblance of hope that, that needs something. Is there any point to this life? Is, is there any purpose? We have a hope that we can share that is beyond the hope of anything else. Amen. And thus the conclusion of this chapter and the practical application specifically and especially for the pastor is this. Speak these things. Exhort these things. Rebuke these things with all authority. Let no one despise you. That's the pastor's job. Instruct these things. Exhort the church in these things. And even rebuke the congregation if need be in these things. To rebuke in this manner is not to be, to, to be harsh or to be mean or to be cruel in any way, but rather, but rather to bring about correction to these things if need be. Because you know as well as I know, churches can get off on different tangents, and we can be off on this line, and, and, and we can be following down this rabbit hole thinking we're serving God, when we're actually we've, we've kind of taken a little bit of a detour off to the side for whatever reason. And so times may come that the pastor must rebuke the congregation and bring them back to, hey, this is kind of important here. This is what is needed here instead of going down whatever rabbit trail the church may have gone down. To rebuke in this manner is to bring these things to the congregation's attention. Through preaching, through teaching, through one-on-one -on -one discipleship and conversations, so that the congregation, of whom the pastor is a part, can implement these things. As verse 10 said that I've mentioned so many times, so that we can adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior. The final note of this chapter says this, let no one despise you. That's not to say that the pastor is not above rebuke or correction. It's not to say that the pastor is always right. Rather, it was to say this, Titus, he was a young man. He was up against a difficult job. Excuse me. And as difficult as that job was going to be, Titus was going to face a lot of opposition. Even back in verse 1, we saw this. What? Those, especially those of the circumcision. He was going to face a lot of problems inside the church. Yes, outside for sure. But inside the church, he was going to face a lot of problems. And Paul even told Timothy, uh, let no man despise your youth. Because as young men, they were going to face a lot of people that were set in their ways. And this is how we've always done things. This is how we're always going to do things. And, and this is what you have to do. And as he was coming in and teaching the truths of, the, of Christ, he was going to face a lot of opposition and a lot of problems. And so he was going to have to know, I'm going to have to stand my ground. And Newt Larson put it this way. To let no one despise him meant this. He was going to have to stand his ground. He was going to have to speak the truth. And he was going to have to model the message. He was going to have to live these things out. 
Again, what good is it for me to get up here and tell you, you need to work like this, you need to live like this, you need to hope like this, if I don't do them myself? So that is the exhortation of pastor. Let's pray.